hello everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Cluck and Weekly. Joining us this week is an old friend of mine, Azim Astana from Amolino. Welcome, Azim. Thank you so much, Luca. Glad to be here. And uh, hi, everyone. So Azim is the CEO and founder of Amolino.ai, a very interesting product in the AI space. And But I'll let Azim introduce yourself. Can you give a quick introduction, please? Absolutely. Love to. So Amolino is an AI-based AI personal and professional assistant for your life. The cool thing is it's based on your emails. And I'll just take a second to explain like what that means is if you think about the data that is in your email, whether it's your work email or your personal email, there is so much data about your day-to-day -day life in your email. So Amelino is a personal assistant that is finding information about you based on your email, and then it can act on your behalf like how you would act. So that's what Amelino AI does. Nice. Well, that's, uh, I mean, that's probably my one of my favorite use cases. I think right now, uh, the main time savings that I've had with using AI, I learned about a few things is really just getting the more mundane tasks uh, done. And the uh, I really like the idea of exploring the amount of data that everybody produces and we have, and it's uh, it's out there. You don't really even know. So it is, uh, it's really, really interesting. So how did, I mean, how did you get started? How, what was well, the idea that prompted this? Just having too many emails? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. In fact, that is exactly what happened, uh, Luca. You know, I, 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 I looked at uh, my own email one day, and you know, the, the one thing that really bugs me about my email is that I have thousands of unread emails, as I'm sure everybody else does as well. You know, even if you make your best efforts uh, to do something that's called like zero inbox, it never really happens. And you just imagine, you know, the amount of time people spend reading their emails and yet they're never able to catch it. You know, worse, if you think about it, there is so much information in the email, but we have you yourself working through that email, trying to understand it, trying to remember it, and then trying to make deeper connections between what one email said and what another email said. This is something that artificial intelligence through its recent innovation and revolution of large language large language models is completely excellent in doing. So why should we tax the human brain in doing something that AI through LLMs can do? Look at that was kind of the, the key idea. That was the pain prop, the pain point that we set out to solve at Amelino. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's a... Uh... And well, just as being a technical person, I was curious about the underpinnings of what you, what, how it works. So how do you connect a Molino to your existing data sources? I am so glad you asked, Luca. Um, so right now, uh, Amelino is available as a Chrome plugin that acts on your Gmail. So when you go to gmail.com in your browser, Amelino will extract the email that you're reading. The, the Chrome ex, uh, extension will extract the email you're reading, send it to the back end of Amelino, and analyzes the email to extract what's called named entities. And once that is done, Amelino gives you back, you know, what are the key points of the email? You know, what are the key topics that are being discussed in the email? It breaks it down so that you can now focus on the critical things. And it also gives you a recommendation on what to do with the email. So, you know, sometimes you wonder uh, if you're reading an email, you're wondering, should I just delete it? Should I archive it? Should I come back to it later? Amelino will tell you, hey, this email has an Amazon tracking number. I remember it. Go ahead and delete that email. Things like that. You asked a little bit about the, uh, the technical side. So the one thing is we don't use open AI, the reason we don't currently use open AI and we don't have plans on using it. Yeah, I see you, uh, you know, thinking about it. <laughs> it is. Um, we used it to prototype. It's a great product, but Amelino is designed for privacy conscious you know, people as well as privacy, privacy conscious organizations. Um, the thing with open AI, even though it's an excellent LLM, it's the world's best right now, the thing with that is 
there is no way to guarantee that the data you send to OpenAI will not be used by OpenAI for further training, right? And we want to stand behind our customers to say that, look, email is a very personal and private thing. We will never train our models to benefit somebody else based on your emails, and therefore we can't use uh, OpenAI. So we're using local LLMs. Wow, that is that is really really interesting. It is uh, it's something that you don't hear much in the business, to be fair. And I think you make a very good point. The uh, even using so some people uh, short that up by running. You know, you can get uh, an OpenAI instance on Azure that they say that it isolates you from the main engine. That that even the license for that is not very convincing. Like they sort of say. Uh, they never promise anything. It's very weird. You're right. It's uh, almost yeah. like it's on purpose. It, it's, you know, the more you think about this problem, imagine that, uh, you know, 10 different organizations are using Amelino and they all find out that they are benefiting from other organizations' data and other organizations are benefiting from your own data. You know, that's just a a nightmare from privacy point of view. That's a nightmare from the point of view of competition. You don't want your competition to learn your trade secrets through leakages in LLMs. So what Amelino does and is going to continue to do is it creates a local LLM, a fine-tuned local LLM for each customer. So, you know, that not only isolates it, there is really no way to break those boundaries and your data always stays within your uh, within your organization that's i mean that is really really cool so i assume you're using one of the barrels uh i want to ask you what the engine is of course but the base technique so it's fine tuning right you're fine tuning uh, or is it a mixture of others like retrieval augmented i guess you're using it all because it's the only way to get something to work we're doing it all right now so there is retrieval augmentation and, and generation uh, rags and we use that for the idea. So remember, I told you that uh, Amelino breaks an email apart into what's called as named entities. Um, it does a similarity search to merge those named entities into you know what are similar named entities, and then we store that into a retrieval database, a vector database. Next time when you try to read that email, it makes the connections for you between different entities, and that's where we use rags. Uh, we do do uh, fine tune fine tuning uh, on models, but we also provide a context to the model uh, to to make things faster. So we use all these techniques that are now popular in the world of LLMs uh, out there. Good. So, uh, well, another very common question you get probe is how long did it take to get a Molino to the market? That's a very excellent. That's a very very good question, Luca. Uh, we started Amelino, you know, right before summer. But I would say the first three months of um, of that period were just tinkering, just playing with different ideas. What sticks? What doesn't stick? So it really didn't make a lot of progress at that time. We were just, you know, trying to see, you know, which direction to go into. Uh, the the pace of development really kicked up in uh, in the last two months. So I would say. You know, mid-August is when we put our heads down um, and uh, started really cranking out code, started cranking out prototypes and MVPs. So mid-August to now, so about two months is what it took for an MVP to, to come out. Hmm. Yeah, that's, so that, that's not long. I mean, that, that's amazing compared, considering what you've been doing because there's, again, the uh, main problem is, well, one of the problems we face is wanting to use a different AI, which makes total sense. Although I feel like the hardest problem in this type of, so I, as you know, I work in Delta, so I generally work on something that's slightly different. But I, as everybody else, I've been playing with this, and I feel like the hardest problem is not even the engine you use, but data ingestion, like the ability to truly be able to read and interpret data in a way that's meaningful. Because if you just go through tutorials, of course, your company, you're not that case, but as myself, you go through a tutorial like Lama Indexed or Langchain, there's a few open source libraries. Uh, you end up something with 90% of the time, it doesn't even work. And you're not even sure why it's broken. So my question is, 
uh, did your engineers work on any kind of uh, evaluation framework? Like, how do you make sure a Molino works? Which you know it's a dumb question posed that way, but I, I, understand, I think you understand what I mean. I, actually, I don't think this is a dumb question at all because, you know, what many of our uh, viewers might or might not realize is that working with large language models is inherently different from working with other kinds of computer programs. You know, with other kinds of computer programs, there is a deterministic output. If you give an input of, you know, something with the same program, you, you're guaranteed to get the same output over and over again. Large language models are very, very undeterministic or non-deterministic, I should say. You know, given the same input, they can give you completely different outputs every single time, right? So you you've hit on a, you've hit on a very very important point, Luca, which is, you know, a large part of this engineering effort is not just making sure that you know we can use the right engines, which is important, but also the 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 data that goes in cleaning the data more importantly making sure that the data that comes out of the llm engine is first of all both correctly formatted as well as it makes sense so there's a lot of engineering that goes on in trying to make sure that the the, the data that comes out is in the right format like json that our programs can ingest and it makes sense. And you know, I won't say we've completely cracked that. I won't say anybody would have cracked that. So it's an ongoing effort to continue making sure that the data is not uh, nonsensical. Yeah, the, the problem of correctness is very fundamental in LLM usage because it's, uh, especially when you're trying to generate answers. In the case of Amolino, I feel like you're starting from a very good uh, data set because that's the data from a person's everyday life and that sort of makes sense in general. So if you're looking for answers within that corpus, it's not, I mean, it usually will be correct. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that you're starting working with legal too. And in the legal field, I have a friend who's been experimenting with a couple of prototypes I've been helping when I have time, which is not much, but I try to help. Uh, and this problem has been hallucinations that are very believable. Like, if you ask an LLM a legal question, you will get an answer that sounds like it was written by the most expensive lawyer in New York City, a $10,000 an hour lawyer. And then you, you go look it up and it says, this is law number three uh, of the state of Arkansas, uh, published on September 30th, uh, 2004. And you go look for that law and it doesn't exist. It just made up a sentence that sounds like it's... Uh, so the correctness problem is really, really relevant. And yeah, I think it is. You know, one of the things that uh, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the things that we are doing, but like I said, this is an ongoing problem and it will continue being an ongoing problem. But I'll share one of the techniques that we use to try to mitigate the correctness problem. So let's take the example that you were just talking about, which is, you know, you ask a legal question or a technical question or a social question um, and, you know, the AI engine will give you a very convincing looking answer. You're trying to figure out if that answer is actually accurate, factually accurate or not. So one of the things that we do is we also use the concept of independent agents or autonomous agents. So once we get the answer back, we spin up an autonomous agent to go browse the web and double check that answer. This is easier yeah. than searching the web because searching the web is for, an, for a vague concept is very, very hard. But once you have a starting point, then you can go check, you know, you can tell your autonomous agent to go check the state of Louisiana's website to see if that, that law exists or not. And if there are any red flags or if there's any probabilistic indicators that there is a problem, we reduce the confidence or the confidence score of that answer in our minds. And you know, those are some of the ways we're trying to make sure that the, the answers we're giving is within an acceptable bound of confidence. Yeah, the um, I feel like the uh, underlying thing is going to be, another thing that worked for me is uh, using autonomous agents to double check. Very often, if you ask, granted, this is GPT, might not work for all engines, but if you ask the engine, are you sure, it will very often correct itself and give you the right answer. 
which is something I cannot figure out. The other thing that's always amazed me, and I know if you experienced that, is it's almost impossible to get an LLM to tell you, I don't know, yep. which is actually a problem. <laughs> it is a problem. Yeah. But, you know, uh, it is definitely a problem. You know, if you talk a little bit more about autonomous agents, uh, the, yeah. the technology of autonomous agents is actually very, very, uh, uh, I would say, marvelous. It, it's also very useful. You know, I'll give you an example of what Amelino uh, is going to be able to do in the near short term. Uh, we can take an example. Uh, so, again, you know, like Luca mentioned, Luca and I have known each other for a while and we've worked together. Um, so we'll take an example from our shared uh, work life, uh, Luca and my shared work life. And one of the things that, uh, you know, Luca has had to do um, is fill up what is known as RFPs or RFIs, you know, request for information or request for proposals. Uh, you know, these are um, documents often sent over by prospective customers where they ask a whole bunch of questions about your product in the attempt to try to see if the product is good for them or not. These are very, very time consuming. I'm sure, Luca, you would agree that these are very, oh, yeah. very time consuming and painful, right? But again, if you go back and think about, um, you know, what is in your email, answers to those questions, or at least answers to 90% of those questions are likely already in your email. So an autonomous agent can be spun up to fill out the RFP to the best of its knowledge. And then all you have to do is just double check its answers and it can save you easily three, four hours per RFP. So that's another use of the autonomous agents that uh, Amelino is, is going to be doing in the next. That is, that, that's really, yeah. I, that, that, this is an example I was making yesterday about, you know, the new GPT large context. It's like, it fits like 400 pages of documentation in it. Uh, but one request is like a dollar, a dollar point five or something like that, dollar and a half. So it's very expensive. But then someone pointed out to me that an autonomous agent like that can easily save you two, three, four hours. Like, are you trying to proofread a 400 page manual you finished writing? You ask an LLM and it takes three seconds and it costs you two dollars. Having yeah. someone else doing it is going to cost you couple thousand bucks, maybe less, mm -hmm. but what do, what do you want to spend less for something that's proofreading your work? No. So you're going to have the best proofreader. Right. So it's very, yeah. it is, uh, it's very, the other thing is that I think Molino falls right in is the ability to do more things simultaneously. We are very good at doing a lot of things, but we can only do one at a time with any degree of success. You can try doing more, but we, we will try it with this business especially, but it doesn't, never works out. Uh, so, for example, think about a uh, call center agent. You have someone calling in, which is something I will ask you about later. You have someone calling yeah. in, you need an agent. If you have 10 calls, you need 10 agents. If you have an AI agent, you just need one person, well, not even one zero. Person. Person. And you can right. take 100 calls. So speaking of which, you think Amolino could be useful in the future in becoming some kind of a front-end assistant for a company, given that it knows everything about the company itself. So someone I can call and ask questions. It, I, I, I absolutely think so. And that is something that we've been playing with. In fact, I know that SignalWire has now recently, has recently introduced AI-based engines for voice calling. And I'm personally very excited about that technology because I can see in the near future, Amelino using a signal wires AI technology to build these kinds of autonomous agents. And like you said, since Amelino knows everything about that company, I could see building voice agents where you would just call a 1-800 number that is answered by signal wires voice technology. You ask the question, that question is sent back to Amelino Amelino gives back the answer to the signal wire AI agent, and that is translated back to the caller. It is, it is all very seamless, and it just sim simplifies things so much for both the company and the customer gets better quality answers than an agent that might or might not be trained. You know, agent, pe human people get tired, computers don't. So I think this is a win-win situation for the customer, signal wire, and Amelino. Yeah, that's well, let's take a look. So it should be very fun. Yeah, the fact the autonomous agent concept is really interesting in that case because an agent, someone 
So a voice assistant, we've all had to deal with classic IVRs that you call right. and you want to change your phone plan. Press one if you want to know your balance. Press two if you want to. And then it never goes anywhere. So I don't think an AI by itself is enough. You need some kind of agent to truly right. bring that out. Because people will ask weird questions. Or they would just say, some, they will ask for something that's good, but they will ask for in their own words. So it's not always what the bot expects. It might be worded differently. Yeah, I want no, to know how much money I have. It's not the same as asking for a balance, but it's what you want to know. Exactly. Well, it's also the problem actually in calling um, customer support lines is worse. And I'm sure we've all had this experience where you know, we have a problem that doesn't fit the template of the customer support agent. And, you know, they're only trained to, you know, solve 20 different problems. Oh, my shipping order is delayed. Oh, my shipping order is uh, broken and things like that. But the moment you have a problem that doesn't fit their template, that agent doesn't have the training or the authority to do anything. And this is a problem that an AI, autonomous AI agent can solve very well because it can have on its fingertips you know, a vast amount of data and it can recommend an escalation without the customer getting frustrated. So from a customer experience point of view, this marriage of autonomous agents and signal wire, signal wire um, AI technology is actually something that will solve a lot of problems for customers. Yeah, in voice, you have the added problem, which is very often understated that getting a voice AI bot working quite right has a lot of mundane, but very important issues to solve. Like there's a problem yeah. with the uh, there's a problem with the voice, so it has to be quick, has to be uh, responsive. It's not just right. recording and sh if you want to record, ship the recording off to something that will do the text to speech. Sorry, speech to text. Then ship right. that string off to an AI. Then come back, <laughs> get the text to speech, and send it. To it's going to take ten seconds every time. So that mundane part is actually the what we've been focusing on because it empowers a lot of usage. So. Amolino is a great engine that will fit right in. It's uh, there, there are a lot of little little things. Well, going back to Amolino, I'm curious if you can say this. Just one quite one technical question: If you're using a vector database, which vector database are you using? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we are currently using Pinecone, um, and I'll tell you why we choose it. You know, we're uh, look, we're a startup, so we don't have. We are prioritizing velocity. We're prioritizing getting products to market in front of our customers as quickly as possible. So we're not spending days and weeks evaluating uh, different vector databases. Um, I came across Pinecone uh, early on in the life cycle of Amelino. We've stuck with that. We see no reason to change it right now. Maybe as the company grows, we'll reevaluate it. But for now, it's Pinecone. Well, I mean, the, honestly, I don't even know if you want to go outside of that. I've been... I've been experimenting again. I didn't have much time, but that's something we focused on really uh, because my friend is a lawyer and uh, RAG is too important in that area because you have tens of thousands of pages to index. So you need to find a way to do that. And honestly, Pinecone is the only one that gave me good results aside from using PG Vector, the Postgres embedded uh, vector. Postgres database. Too, right? It's very good. It's slow, but it's very good. All of the others, yeah. I could barely tell they were working, which is interesting. So I'm probably very new to this, and it's just a. Uh, I don't think anybody has the full skill set at the moment. I don't know if you. I mean, you probably have pl plans of hiring. Are you having trouble actually hiring? <laughs> uh, it's a it's a challenge. Uh, you know, this is a very very hot space. Uh, there's a lot of demand for talent, good talent in this. Uh, you know, we are continuously looking for uh, full stack people. We're looking uh, our our stack is uh, React in the front end and um, uh, Python um, in the in So we, we use FastAPI as the as the web server. Uh, we use NumPy and a lot of other running uh, tech machine back end. So you know, we're looking for full stack, front end, uh, back end, UX, all around the, the board. But hiring, as I'm sure you know, Luca, continues to be a challenge. But you know, it's something that every startup, every company struggles with. So we're not unique there. Yeah, how it feels like in the AI space right now is that it's so new and it changes so quickly that uh, aside from the core data scientists that work, that work on creating LLMs themselves, which is a separate set, and you don't need to hire one of those. 
should work at different companies. Uh, the, um, the other people you can hire are going to all have the same experience more or less, like GPT-4 is six months old. So we will start it from, from there. It's not like we, there's nobody knows it super well. Yeah, as we're saying, the hiring issues, I mean, everybody started from the same moment as what I was saying. Uh, we have had like a year to learn it, like even the best people in the industry, again, aside from data scientists who actually work on the LLMs themselves, which in itself is also a different profession, in my opinion. Uh, we've yeah. all had about a year to learn it. So there's no real way to hire super good people. We're all on the same level. So we learn as we go. It's uh, really, that's why I think goes back to the evaluation problem is really important. Like how you keep things, we have to learn how to make sure the results are good. Testing is my focus at the moment. I'm trying to learn how to test LLMs, which is very, it's tricky and interesting. It is. It is. It's everybody's learning. Like you said, everybody's learning on the job. So I think we're all uh, in the same boat. Yeah. And I feel like in the industry, there's been a few breakthroughs that even the companies themselves doesn't expect. Like right. <laughs> sometimes it's just or the reverse, like Google say AI is just not very good. I don't even know why. It's, it's surprising, but you're absolutely right, because they were the early pioneers in this whole space. In fact, the whole Transformers uh, idea came from Google researchers, uh, but you know it's OpenAI that's taken the world by storm in LLMs and not Google. Yeah, it's uh, or Amazon didn't even try. Like Amazon has no AI real AI product. Yeah, no, they don't. You're absolutely right, and they are leaders in pretty much everything else. But uh, AWS is a behemoth, but not AI. I think I'm, I think the Mr. Bezos is just happy to make all the money renting out Nvidia GPUs to us. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Well, I'm sure he knows why, what he's, why, he's a smart guy. Yeah, why develop an AI product when you can have a machine that costs eighty six thousand dollars an hour to run because it has right. twenty eight hundred or whatever? Right. So yeah, they, figure out a way to monetize that. That is absolutely right. They're just monetizing that. They're they're being the the casino in the game. Well, Zim, right. thank you very much for joining us. It's uh, always great to hear about you and your projects. And Amolino sounds it's really interesting. I like the idea of the autonomous uh, agent helping you with everyday work. And I'll go check it out because I probably need some help too. <laughs> and well, so, well, it was you. very good talking to you as well, Luca. Thank you for taking the time. And I'm so glad we got to uh, reconnect after uh, after such a long time. So it Absolutely. was it was amazing. So Azim Astana, founder and CEO at Amolino.ai, joined us today. We went through their product, their building, what's coming in the future. Go check it out. And for the rest of the week, goodbye. <laughs>